of the Dolorous Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ by Anne Catherine e. Merrick. Chapter 25. Description of the Personal Appearance of the Blessed Virgin. While these sad events were taking place, I was in Jerusalem, sometimes in one locality and sometimes in another. I was quite overcome, my sufferings were intense, and I felt as if about to expire. During the time of the scourging of my adorable spouse, I sat in the vicinity, in a part which no Jew dared to approach, for fear of defiling himself, but I did not fear defilement. I was only anxious for a drop of our Lord's blood to fall upon me, to purify me. I felt so completely heartbroken that I thought I must die, as I could not relieve Jesus, and each blow which he received drew from me such sobs and moans that I felt quite astonished at not being driven away. When the executioners took Jesus into the guardhouse to crown him with thorns, I longed to follow, that I might again contemplate him in his sufferings. Then it was that the mother of Jesus, accompanied by the holy women, approached the pillar and wiped up the blood with which it and the ground around were saturated. The door of the guardhouse was open, and I heard the brutal laughter of the heartless men, who were busily employed in finishing off the crown of thorns which they had prepared for our Lord. I was too much affected to weep, but I endeavored to drag myself near to the place where our Lord was to be crowned with thorns. I once more saw the Blessed Virgin. Her countenance was wan and pale, her eyes red with weeping, but the simple dignity of her demeanor cannot be described. Notwithstanding her grief and anguish, notwithstanding the fatigue which she had endured, for she had been wandering ever since the previous evening through the streets of Jerusalem and across the valley of Josephat. Her appearance was placid and modest and not a fold of her dress out of place. She looked majestically around and her veil fell gracefully over her shoulders. She moved quietly and although her heart was a prey to the most bitter grief, her countenance was calm and resigned. Her dress was moistened by the dew which had fallen upon it during the night, and by the tears which she had shed in such abundance. Otherwise it was totally unsoiled. Her beauty was great, but indescribable, for it was superhuman, a mixture of majesty, sanctity, simplicity, and purity. The appearance of Mary Magdalene was totally different. She was taller and more robust. The expression of her countenance showed great determination, but its beauty was almost destroyed by the strong passions which she had so long indulged, and by the violent repentance and grief she had since felt. It was painful to look upon her. She was the very picture of despair. Her long disheveled hair was partly covered by her torn and wet veil, and her appearance was that of one completely absorbed by woe and almost beside herself from sorrow. Many of the inhabitants of Magdalene were standing near, gazing at her with surprise and curiosity, for they had known her in former days, first in prosperity, and afterwards in degradation and consequent misery. They pointed, they even cast mud upon her, but she saw nothing, knew nothing, and felt nothing, save her agonizing grief. Chapter 26. The Crowning with Thorns No sooner did Sister Emeric recommence the narrative of her visions on the Passion than she again became extremely ill, oppressed with fever, and so tormented by violent thirst that her tongue was perfectly parched and contracted. And on the Monday after Mid-Lent Sunday, she was so exhausted that it was not without great difficulty, and after many intervals of rest, that she narrated all which our Lord suffered in his crowning with thorns. She was scarcely able to speak, because she herself felt every sensation, which she described in the following account. Pilate harangued the populace many times during the time of the scourging of Jesus, but they interrupted him once and vociferated, 
He shall be executed, even if we die for it. When Jesus was led into the guardhouse, they all cried out again, Crucify him! Crucify him! After this, there was silence for a time. Pilate occupied himself in giving different orders to the soldiers, and the servants of the high priests brought them some refreshments, after which Pilate, whose superstitious tendencies made him uneasy in mind, went into the inner part of his palace in order to consult his gods and to offer them incense. When the Blessed Virgin and the Holy Women had gathered up the blood of Jesus, with which the pillar and the adjacent parts were saturated, they left the forum and went into a neighboring small house, the owner of which I do not know. John was not, I think, present at the scourging of Jesus. A gallery encircled the inner court of the guard house, where our Lord was crowned with thorns, and the door was open. The cowardly ruffians, who were eagerly waiting to gratify their cruelty by torturing and insulting our Lord, were about fifty in number, and the greatest part, slaves or servants of the jailers and soldiers. The mob gathered around the building, but were soon displaced by a thousand Roman soldiers, who were drawn up in good order and stationed there. Although forbidden to leave their ranks, these soldiers nevertheless did their utmost by laughter and applause to incite the cruel executioners to redouble their insults, and as public applause gives fresh energy to a comedian, so did their words of encouragement increase tenfold the cruelty of these men. In the middle of the court there stood the fragment of a pillar, and on it was placed a very low stool, which these cruel men maliciously covered with sharp flints and bits of broken pot shards. Then they tore off the garments of Jesus, thereby reopening all his wounds, threw over his shoulders an old scarlet mantle, which barely reached his knees, dragged him to the seat prepared, and pushed him roughly down upon it, having first placed the crown of thorns upon his head. The crown of thorns was made of three branches plaited together, the greatest part of the thorns being purposely turned inwards so as to pierce our Lord's head. Having first placed these twisted branches on his forehead, they tied them tightly together at the back of his head, and no sooner was this accomplished to their satisfaction than they put a large reed into his hand, doing all with derisive gravity, as if they were really crowning him king. They then seized the reed, and struck his head so violently that his eyes were filled with blood. They knelt before him, derided him, spat in his face, and buffeted him, saying at the same time, Hail, King of the Jews! Then they threw down his stool, pulled him up again from the ground on which he had fallen, and reseated him with the greatest possible brutality. It is quite impossible to describe the cruel outrages which were thought of and perpetrated by these monsters under human form. The sufferings of Jesus from thirst, caused by the fever which his wounds and sufferings had brought on, were intense. He trembled all over, his flesh was torn piecemeal, his tongue contracted, and the only refreshment he received was the blood which trickled from his head onto his parched lips. This shameful scene was protracted a full half hour, and the Roman soldiers continued the whole time to applaud and encourage the perpetration of still greater outrages. Chapter 27 Ecce Homo the cruel executioners then reconducted our Lord to Pilate's palace, with the scarlet cloak still thrown over his shoulders, the crown of thorns on his head, and the reed in his fettered hands. He was perfectly unrecognizable, his eyes, mouth, and beard being covered with blood, his body but one wound, and his back bowed down as that of an aged man, while every limb trembled as he walked. When Pilate saw him standing at the entrance of his tribunal, even he, hard-hearted as he usually was, 
started and shuddered with horror and compassion, whilst the barbarous priests and the populace, far from being moved to pity, continued their insults and mockery. When Jesus had ascended the stairs, Pilate came forward. The trumpet was sounded to announce that the governor was about to speak, and he addressed the chief priests and the bystanders in the following words. Behold, I bring him forth to you, that you may know that I find no cause in him. The archers then led Jesus up to Pilate, that the people might again feast their cruel eyes on him, in the state of degradation to which he was reduced. Terrible and heart-rending, indeed, was the spectacle he presented, and an exclamation of horror burst from the multitude, followed by a dead silence, when he with difficulty raised his wounded head, crowned as it was with thorns, and cast his exhausted glance on the excited throng. Pilate exclaimed, as he pointed out to the people, Ecce homo! Behold the man! The hatred of the high priests and their followers was, if possible, increased at the sight of Jesus, and they cried out, Put him to death! Crucify him! Are you not content? said Pilate. The punishment he has received is beyond question, sufficient to deprive him of all desire of making himself king. But they cried out the more, and the multitude joined in the cry, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate then sounded the trumpet to demand silence, and said, Take you him and crucify him, for I find no cause in him. We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, replied the priests, because he made himself the son of God. These words, he made himself the son of God, revived the fears of Pilate. He took Jesus into another room and asked him, Whence art thou? But Jesus made no answer. Speakest thou not to me? said Pilate. Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee and power to release thee? Thou shouldest not have any power against me, replied Jesus, unless it were given thee from above. Therefore he that hath delivered me to thee hath the greater sin. The undecided, weak conduct of Pilate filled Claudia Proclus with anxiety. She again sent him the pledge to remind him of his promise, but he only returned a vague, superstitious answer, importing that he should leave the decision of the case to the gods. The enemies of Jesus, the high priests and the Pharisees, having heard of the efforts which were being made by Claudia to save him, caused a report to be spread among the people that the partisans of our Lord had seduced her, that he would be released and then join the Romans and bring about the destruction of Jerusalem and extermination of the Jews. Pilate was in such a state of indecision and uncertainty as to be perfectly beside himself. He did not know what step to take next and again addressed himself to the enemies of Jesus, declaring that, he found no crime in him, but they demanded his death still more clamorously. He then remembered the contradictory accusations which had been brought against Jesus, the mysterious dreams of his wife, and the unaccountable impression which the words of Jesus had made on himself, and therefore determined to question him again in order thus to obtain some information which might enlighten him as to the course he ought to pursue. He therefore returned to the praetorium, went alone into a room, and sent for our Savior. He glanced at the mangled and bleeding form before him and exclaimed inwardly, Is it possible that he can be a god? Then he turned to Jesus and adjured him to tell him if he was God, if he was that king who had been promised to the Jews, where his kingdom was, and to what class of gods he belonged. I can only give the sense of the words of Jesus, but they were solemn and severe. He told him that his kingdom was not of this world, 
and he likewise spoke strongly of the many hidden crimes with which the conscience of Pilate was defiled, warned him of the dreadful fate which would be his if he did not repent, and finally declared that he himself, the Son of Man, would come at the last day to pronounce a just judgment upon him. Pilate was half frightened and half angry at the words of Jesus. He returned to the balcony and again declared that he would release Jesus, but they cried out, If thou release this man, thou art not Caesar's friend, for whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. Others said that they would accuse him to the emperor of having disturbed their festival, that he must make up his mind at once, because they were obliged to be in the temple by ten o'clock at night. The cry, Crucify him! Crucify him! resounded on all sides. It re-echoed even from the flat roof of the houses near the forum, where many persons were assembled. Pilate saw that all his efforts were in vain, that he could make no impression on the infuriated mob, their yells and imprecations were deafening, and he began to fear an insurrection. Therefore he took water and washed his hands before the people, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just man. Look you to it. A frightful and unanimous cry then came forth from the dense multitude who were assembled from all parts of Palestine. His blood be upon us, and upon our children. Chapter 28. Reflections on the Visions. Whenever, during my meditations on the Passion of our Lord, I imagine I hear that frightful cry of the Jews, His blood be upon us, and upon our children. Visions of a wonderful and terrible description display before my eyes, at the same moment, the effect of that solemn curse, I fancy I see a gloomy sky covered with clouds of the color of blood from which issue fiery swords and darts lowering over the vociferating multitude and this curse which they have entailed upon themselves appears to me to penetrate even to the very marrow of their bones, even to the unborn infants. They appear to me encompassed on all sides by darkness the words they utter take, in my eyes, the form of black flames, which recoil upon them, penetrating the bodies of some, and only playing around others. The last mentioned were those who were converted after the death of Jesus, and who were in considerable numbers, for neither Jesus or Mary ever ceased praying, in the midst of their sufferings, for the salvation of these miserable beings. When during visions of this kind, I turn my thoughts to the holy souls of Jesus and Mary, and to those of the enemies of Christ, all that takes place within them is shown me under various forms. I see numerous devils among the crowd, exciting and encouraging the Jews, whispering in their ears, entering their mouths, inciting them still more against Jesus, but nevertheless, trembling at the sight of his ineffable love and heavenly patience. Innumerable angels surround Jesus, Mary, and the small number of saints who are there. The exterior of these angels denotes the office they fill. Some represent consolation, others prayer, and some of the works of mercy. I likewise often see consolatory and at other times menacing voices, under the appearance of bright or colored gleams of light, issuing from the mouths of these different apparitions, and I see the feelings of their souls, their interior sufferings, and in a word, their every thought, under the appearance of dark or bright rays. I then understand everything perfectly, but it is impossible for me to give an explanation to others, Besides which, I am so ill, and so totally overcome by the grief which I feel for my own sins, and for those of the world. I am so overpowered by the sight of the sufferings of our Lord, that I can hardly imagine how it is possible for me to relate events with the slightest coherency. Many of these things, 
but more especially the apparitions of devils and of angels which are related by other persons who have had visions of the passion of jesus christ are fragments of symbolical interior perceptions of this species which vary according to the state of the soul of the spectator hence the numerous contradictions because many things are naturally forgotten or omitted sister emeric sometimes spoke on these subjects either during the time of her visions on the passion or before they commenced but she more often refused to speak at all concerning them for fear of causing confusion in the visions it is easy to see how difficult it must have been for her in the midst of such a variety of apparitions to preserve any degree of connection in her narrations who can therefore be surprised at finding some omissions and confusion in her descriptions chapter twenty nine jesus condemned to be crucified pilate who did not desire to know the truth but was solely anxious to get out of the difficulty without harm to himself became more undecided than ever his conscience whispered jesus is innocent his wife said he is holy his superstitious feelings made him fear that jesus was the enemy of his gods and his cowardice filled him with dread lest jesus if he was a god should wreak his vengeance upon his judge he was both irritated and alarmed at the last words of jesus and he made another attempt for his release but the jews instantly threatened to lay an accusation against him before the emperor this menace terrified him and he determined to accede to their wishes although firmly convinced in his own mind of the innocence of jesus and perfectly conscious that by pronouncing sentence of death upon him he should violate every law of justice besides breaking the promise he had made to his wife in the morning thus did he sacrifice jesus to the enmity of the jews and endeavor to stifle remorse by washing his hands before the people saying i am innocent of the blood of this just man look you to it vainly dost thou pronounce these words o pilate for his blood is on thy head likewise thou canst not wash his blood from thy soul as thou dost from thy hands those fearful words his blood be upon us and upon our children had scarcely ceased to resound when pilate commenced his preparations for passing sentence he called for the dress which he wore on state occasions put on a species of diadem set in precious stones on his head changed his mantle and caused a staff to be carried before him he was surrounded with soldiers preceded by officers belonging to the tribunal and followed by scribes who carried rolls of parchments and books used for inscribing names and dates one man walked in front who carried the trumpet the procession marched in this order from pilate's palace to the forum where an elevated seat used on these particular occasions was placed opposite to the pillar where jesus was scourged this tribunal was called gabbatha it was a kind of round terrace ascended by means of staircases on the top was a seat for pilate and behind this seat a bench for those minor offices while a number of soldiers were stationed round the terrace and upon the staircases many of the pharisees had left the palace and were gone to the temple so that annas caiaphas and twenty-eight priests alone followed the roman governor on to the forum and the two thieves were taken there at the time that pilate presented our lord to the people saying ecce homo our lord was still clothed in his purple garment his crown of thorns upon his head and his hands manacled when the archers brought him up to the tribunal and placed him between the two malefactors as soon as pilate was seated he again addressed the enemies of jesus in these words behold your king but the cries of crucify him crucify him resounded on all sides shall i crucify your king said pilate 
We have no king but Caesar, responded the high priest. Pilate found it was utterly hopeless to say anything more, and therefore commenced his preparations for passing sentence. The two thieves had received their sentence of crucifixion some time before, but the high priest had obtained a respite for them in order that our Lord might suffer the additional ignominy of being executed with two criminals of the most infamous description. The crosses of the two thieves were by their sides. That intended for our Lord was not brought, because he was not as yet sentenced to death. The Blessed Virgin, who had retired to some distance after the scourging of Jesus, again approached to hear the sentence of death pronounced upon her son and her God. Jesus stood in the midst of the archers at the foot of the staircase leading up to the tribunal. The trumpet was sounded to demand silence, and then the cowardly, the base judge, in a tremulous, undecided voice, pronounced the sentence of death on the just man. The sight of the cowardice and duplicity of this despicable being, who was nevertheless puffed up with pride at his important position, almost overcame me and the ferocious joy of the executioners, the triumphant countenances of the high priests, added to the deplorable condition to which our loving Savior was reduced, and the agonizing grief of his beloved mother still further increased my pain. I looked up again and saw the cruel Jews almost devouring their victim with their eyes, the soldiers standing coldly by, and multitudes of horrible demons passing to and fro and mixing in the crowd. I felt that I ought to have been in the place of Jesus, my beloved spouse, for the sentence would not then have been unjust. But I was so overcome with anguish, and my sufferings were so intense, that I cannot exactly remember all that I did see. However, I will relate all as nearly as I can. After a long preamble, which was composed principally of the most pompous and exaggerated eulogy of the Emperor Tiberius, Pilate spoke of the accusations which had been brought against Jesus by the high priests. He said that they had condemned him to death for having disturbed the public peace and broken their laws by calling himself the Son of God and King of the Jews, and that the people had unanimously demanded that their decree should be carried out. Notwithstanding his oft-repeated conviction of the innocence of Jesus, this mean and worthless judge was not ashamed of saying that he likewise considered their decision a just one, and that he should therefore pronounce sentence which he did in these words. I condemn Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, to be crucified. And he ordered the executioners to bring the cross. I think I remember likewise that he took a long stick in his hands, broke it, and threw the fragments at the feet of Jesus. On hearing these words of Pilate, the mother of Jesus became for a few moments totally unconscious, for she was now certain that her beloved son must die, the most ignominious and the most painful of all deaths. John and the holy women carried her away to prevent the heartless beings who surrounded them from adding crime to crime by jeering at her grief. But no sooner did she revive a little than she begged to be taken again to each spot which had been sanctified by the sufferings of her son, in order to bedew them with her tears. And thus did the mother of our Lord, in the name of the church, take possession of those holy places. Pilate then wrote down the sentence, and those who stood behind him copied it out three times. The words which he wrote were quite different from those he had pronounced. I could see plainly that his mind was dreadfully agitated, an angel of wrath appeared to guide his hand. The substance of the written sentence was this. I have been compelled, for fear of an insurrection, to yield to the wishes of the high priests, the Sanhedrin, and the people, who tumultuously demanded the death of Jesus of Nazareth, 
whom they accused of having disturbed the public peace, and also of having blasphemed and broken their laws. I have given him up to them to be crucified, although their accusations appear to me groundless. I have done so for fear of their alleging to the emperor that I encouraged insurrections and caused dissatisfaction among the Jews by denying them the rights of justice. He then wrote the inscription for the cross while his clerks copied out the sentence several times that these copies might be sent to the distant parts of the country. The high priests were extremely dissatisfied at the words of the sentence, which they said were not true, and they clamorously surrounded the tribunal to endeavor to persuade him to alter the inscription and not to put King of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate was vexed and answered impatiently, What I have written, I have written. They were likewise anxious that the cross of our Lord should not be higher than those of the two thieves, but it was necessary for it to be so, because there would otherwise not have been sufficient place for Pilate's inscription. They therefore endeavored to persuade him not to have this obnoxious inscription put up at all. But Pilate was determined, and their words made no impression upon him. The cross was therefore obliged to be lengthened by a fresh bit of wood. Consequently, the form of the cross was peculiar. The two arms stood out like the branches of a tree growing from the stem, and the shape was very like that of the letter Y with the lower part lengthened so as to rise between the arms, which had been put on separately and were thinner than the body of the cross. A piece of wood was likewise nailed at the bottom of the cross for the feet to rest upon. During the time that Pilate was pronouncing the iniquitous sentence, I saw his wife, Claudia Proclus, send him back the pledge which he had given her, and in the evening she left his palace and joined the friends of our Lord, who concealed her in a subterraneous vault in the house of Lazarus at Jerusalem. Later in the same day, I likewise saw a friend of our Lord engrave the words, Eudex in Eustus, and the name of Claudia Proclus on a green-looking stone, which was behind the terrace called Gabbatha, this stone is still to be found in the foundations of a church or house at Jerusalem, which stands on the spot formerly called Gabbatha. Claudia Proclus became a Christian, followed St. Paul, and became his particular friend. No sooner had Pilate pronounced sentence than Jesus was given up into the hands of the archers, and the clothes which he had taken off in the court of Caiaphas were brought for him to put on again. I think some charitable persons had washed them, for they looked clean. The ruffians who surrounded Jesus untied his hands for his dress to be changed, and roughly dragged off the scarlet mantle with which they had clothed him in mockery, thereby reopening all his wounds. He put on his own linen undergarment with trembling hands, and they threw his scapular over his shoulders. As the crown of thorns was too large and prevented the seamless robe which his mother had made for him from going over his head, they pulled it off violently, heedless of the pain they thus inflicted upon him. His white woolen dress was next thrown over his shoulders and then his wide belt and cloak. After this, they again tied round his waist a ring covered with sharp iron points, and to it, they fastened the cords by which he was led, doing all with their usual brutal cruelty. The two thieves were standing, one on the right and the other on the left of Jesus, with their hands tied and a chain round their necks. They were covered with black and livid marks, the effects of the scourging of the previous day. The demeanor of the one who was afterwards converted was quiet and peaceable, while that of the other, on the contrary, was rough and insolent, and he joined the archers in abusing and insulting Jesus, who looked upon his two companions with love and compassion, and offered up his sufferings for their salvation. 
the archers gathered together all the implements necessary for the crucifixions and prepared everything for the terrible and painful journey to calvary annas and caiaphas at last left off their disputing with pilate and angrily retired taking with them the sheets of parchment on which the sentence was written they went away in haste fearing that they should get to the temple too late for the paschal sacrifice thus did the high priests unknowingly to themselves leave the true paschal lamb they went to a temple made of stone to immolate and to sacrifice that lamb which was but a symbol and they left the true paschal lamb who was being led to the altar of the cross by the cruel executioners they were most careful not to contract exterior defilement while their souls were completely defiled by anger hatred and envy they had said his blood be upon us and upon our children and by these words they had performed the ceremony and had placed the hand of the sacrificer upon the head of the victim thus were the two paths formed the one leading to the altar belonging to the jewish law the other leading to the altar of grace pilate that proud and irresolute pagan that slave of the world who trembled in the presence of the true god and yet adored his false gods took a middle path and returned to his palace the iniquitous sentence was given at about ten in the morning chapter thirty the carriage of the cross when pilate left the tribunal a portion of the soldiers followed him and were drawn up in files before the palace a few accompanying the criminals eight and twenty armed pharisees came to the forum on horseback in order to accompany jesus to the place of execution and among these were the six enemies of jesus who had assisted in arresting him in the garden of olives the archers led jesus into the middle of the court the slaves threw down the cross at his feet and the two arms were forthwith tied on to the center piece jesus knelt down by its side encircled it with his sacred arms and kissed it three times addressing at the same time a most touching prayer of thanksgiving to his heavenly father for that work of redemption which he had begun it was the custom among pagans for the priest to embrace a new altar and jesus in like manner embraced his cross that august altar on which the bloody and expiatory sacrifice was about to be offered the archers soon made him rise and then kneel down again and almost without any assistance placed the heavy cross on his shoulder supporting his great weight with his right hand i saw angels come to his assistance otherwise he would have been unable to raise it from the ground whilst he was on his knees and still praying the executioners put the arms of the crosses which were a little curved and not as yet fastened to the center pieces on the backs of the two thieves and tied their hands tightly to them the middle parts of the crosses were carried by slaves as the traverse pieces were not to be fastened to them until just before the time of execution the trumpet sounded to announce the departure of pilate's horsemen and one of the pharisees belonging to the escort came up to jesus who was still kneeling and said rise we have had a sufficiency of thy fine speeches rise and set off they pulled him roughly up for he was totally unable to rise without assistance and he then felt upon his shoulders the weight of that cross which we must carry after him according to his true and holy command to follow him thus began that triumphant march of the king of kings a march so ignominious on earth and so glorious in heaven by means of ropes which the executioners had fastened to the foot of the cross two archers supported it to prevent its getting entangled in anything and four other soldiers took hold of the ropes which they had fastened to jesus underneath his clothes the sight of our dear lord trembling beneath his burden reminded me forcibly of isaac when he carried the wood destined for his own sacrifice up the mountain 
the trumpet of Pilate was sounded as the signal for departure, for he himself intended to go to Calvary at the head of a detachment of soldiers to prevent the possibility of an insurrection. He was on horseback, in armor, surrounded by officers and a body of cavalry, and followed by three hundred of the infantry, who came from the frontiers of Italy and Switzerland. The procession was headed by a trumpeter, who sounded his trumpet at every corner and proclaimed the sentence. A number of women and children walked behind the procession with ropes, nails, wedges, and baskets filled with different articles in their hands. Others who were stronger carried poles, ladders, and the centerpieces of the crosses of the two thieves, and some of the Pharisees followed on horseback. A boy who had charge of the inscription, which Pilate had written for the cross, likewise carried the crown of thorns, which had been taken off the head of Jesus, at the end of a long stick, but he did not appear to be wicked and hard-hearted like the rest. Next I beheld our blessed Savior and Redeemer, his bare feet were swollen and bleeding, his back bent as though he were about to sink under the heavy weight of the cross and his whole body covered with wounds and blood. He appeared to be half fainting from exhaustion, having had neither refreshment or sleep since the supper of the previous night, weak from loss of blood and parched with thirst produced by fever and pain. He supported the cross on his right shoulder with his right hand, the left hung almost powerless at his side, but he endeavored now and then to hold up his long garment to prevent his bleeding feet from getting entangled in it. The four archers who held the cords, which were fastened round his waist, walked at some distance from him. The two in front pulled him on, and the two behind dragged him back, so that he could not get on at all without the greatest difficulty. His hands were cut by the cords with which they had been bound, his face bloody and disfigured, his hair and beard saturated with blood, the weight of the cross and of his chains combined to press and make the woolen dress cleave to his wounds and reopen them. Derisive and heartless words alone were addressed to him, but he continued to pray for his persecutors, and his countenance bore an expression of combined love and resignation. Many soldiers under arms walked by the side of the procession, and after Jesus came the two thieves who were likewise led, the arms of their crosses, separate from the middle, being placed upon their backs, and their hands tied tightly to the two ends. They were clothed in large aprons, with a sort of sleeveless scapular which covered the upper part of their bodies, and they had straw caps upon their heads. The good thief was calm, but the other was, on the contrary, furious, and never ceased cursing and swearing. The rear of the procession was brought up by the remainder of the Pharisees on horseback, who rode to and fro to keep order. Pilate and his courtiers were at a certain distance behind. He was in the midst of his officers, clad in armor, preceded by a squadron of cavalry, and followed by three hundred foot soldiers. He crossed the forum, and then entered one of the principal streets, for he was marching through the town in order to prevent any insurrection among the people. Jesus was conducted by a narrow back street, that the procession might not inconvenience the persons who were going to the temple, and likewise in order that Pilate and his band might have the whole principal street entirely to themselves. The crowd had dispersed and started in different directions almost immediately after the reading of the sentence, and the greatest part of the Jews either returned to their own houses or to the temple to hasten their preparations for sacrificing the paschal lamb. But a certain number were still hurrying on in disorder to see the melancholy procession pass. The Roman soldiers prevented all persons from joining the procession. Therefore, the most curious were obliged to go round by back streets, or to quicken their steps so as to reach Calvary before Jesus. 
The street through which they led Jesus was both narrow and dirty. He suffered much in passing through it, because the archers were close and harassed him. Persons stood on the roofs of their houses and at the windows, and insulted him with opprobrious language. The slaves who were working in the streets threw filth and mud at him. Even the children, incited by his enemies, had filled their pinafores with sharp stones, which they threw down before their doors as he passed, that he might be obliged to walk over them. Thus did even children show their gratitude to one who had ever been kind and loving to them. Chapter 31 The First Fall of Jesus The street of which we have just spoken, after turning a little to the left, became rather steep, as also wider, a subterranean aqueduct, proceeding from Mount Sion, passed under it, and in its vicinity was a hollow which was often filled with water and mud after rain, and a large stone was placed on its center to enable persons to pass over more easily. When Jesus reached this spot, his strength was perfectly exhausted, he was quite unable to move, and as the archers dragged and pushed him without showing the slightest compassion, he fell quite down against this stone, and the cross fell by his side. The cruel executioners were obliged to stop. They abused and struck him unmercifully. But the whole procession came to a standstill, which caused a degree of confusion. Vainly did he hold out his hand for someone to assist him to rise. Ah, he exclaimed, all will soon be over and he prayed for his enemies. Lift him up, said the Pharisees, otherwise he will die in our hands. There were many women and children following the procession. The former wept, and the latter were frightened. Jesus, however, received support from above and raised his head. But these cruel men, far from endeavoring to alleviate his sufferings, put the crown of thorns again on his head before they pulled him out of the mud, and no sooner was he once more on his feet than they replaced the cross on his back. The crown of thorns which encircled his head increased his pain inexpressibly and obliged him to bend on one side to give room for the cross, which lay heavily on his shoulders. Chapter 32 The Second Fall of Jesus the afflicted mother of Jesus had left the forum, accompanied by John and some other women, immediately after the unjust sentence was pronounced. She had employed herself in walking to many of the spots sanctified by our Lord, and in watering them with her tears. But when the sound of the trumpet, the rush of people, and the clang of the horsemen announced that the procession was about to start for Calvary, she could not resist her longing desire to behold her beloved son once more, and she begged John to take her to some place through which he must pass. John conducted her to a palace which had an entrance in that street which Jesus traversed after his first fall. It was, I believe, the residence of the high priest Caiaphas, whose tribunal was in the division called Sion. John asked and obtained leave from a kind-hearted servant to stand at the entrance mentioned above with Mary and her companions. The mother of God was pale, her eyes were red with weeping, and she was closely wrapped in a cloak of a bluish-gray color. The clamor and insulting speeches of the enraged multitude might be plainly heard, and a herald at that moment proclaimed in a loud voice, that three criminals were about to be crucified. The servant opened the door. The dreadful sounds became more distinct every moment, and Mary threw herself on her knees. After praying fervently, she turned to John and said, Shall I remain? Ought I to go away? Shall I have strength to support such a sight? John made answer, if you do not remain to see him pass, you will grieve afterwards. They remained, therefore, near the door, with their eyes fixed on the procession, which was still distant, but advancing by slow degrees. 
when those who were carrying the instruments for the execution approached and the mother of jesus saw their insolent and triumphant looks she could not control her feelings but joined her hands as if to implore the help of heaven upon which one among them said to his companions what woman is that who is uttering such lamentations another answered she is the mother of the galilean when the cruel men heard this far from being moved to compassion they began to make game of the grief of the most afflicted mother they pointed at her and one of them took the nails which were to be used for fastening jesus to the cross and presented them to her in an insulting manner but she turned away fixed her eyes upon jesus who was drawing near and leant against the pillar for support lest she should again faint from grief for her cheeks were as pale as death and her lips almost blue the pharisees on horseback passed by first followed by the boy who carried the inscription then came her beloved son he was almost sinking under the heavy weight of his cross and his head still crowned with thorns was drooping in agony on his shoulder he cast a look of compassion and sorrow upon his mother staggered and fell for the second time upon his hands and knees mary was perfectly agonized at this sight she forgot all else she saw neither soldiers or executioners she saw nothing but her dearly loved son and springing from the doorway into the midst of the group who were insulting and abusing him she threw herself on her knees by his side and embraced him the only words i heard were beloved son and mother but i do not know whether these words were really uttered or whether they were only in my own mind a momentary confusion ensued john and the holy women endeavored to raise mary from the ground and the archers reproached her one of them saying what hast thou to do here woman he would not have been in our hands if he had been better brought up a few of the soldiers looked touched and although they obliged the blessed virgin to retire to the doorway not one laid hands upon her john and the women surrounded her as she fell half fainting against a stone which was near the doorway and upon which the impression of her hands remained this stone was very hard and was afterwards removed to the first catholic church built in jerusalem near the pool of bethsaida during the time that saint james the less was bishop of that city the two disciples who were with the mother of jesus carried her into the house and the door was shut in the meantime the archers had raised jesus and obliged him to carry the cross in a different manner its arms being unfastened from the center and entangled in the ropes with which he was bound he supported them on his arm and by this means the weight of the body of the cross was a little taken off as it dragged more on the ground i saw numbers of persons standing about in groups the greatest part amusing themselves by insulting our lord in different ways but a few veiled females were weeping chapter thirty three simon of cyrene third fall of jesus the procession had reached an arch formed in an old wall belonging to the town opposite to a square in which three streets terminated when jesus stumbled against a large stone which was placed in the middle of the archway the cross slipped from his shoulder he fell upon the stone and was totally unable to rise many respectable-looking persons who were on their way to the temple stopped and exclaimed compassionately look at that poor man he is certainly dying but his enemies showed no compassion this fall caused a fresh delay as our lord could not stand up again and the pharisees said to the soldiers we shall never get him to the place of execution alive if you do not find someone to carry his cross at this moment simon of cyrene a pagan happened to pass by accompanied by his three children 
He was a gardener, just returning home after working in a garden near the eastern wall of the city and carrying a bundle of lopped branches. The soldiers, perceiving by his dress that he was a pagan, seized him and ordered him to assist Jesus in carrying his cross. He refused at first, but was soon compelled to obey, although his children, being frightened, cried and made a great noise, upon which some women quieted and took charge of them. Simon was much annoyed and expressed the greatest vexation at being obliged to walk with a man in so deplorable a condition of dirt and misery. But Jesus wept and cast such a mild and heavenly look upon him that he was touched, and instead of continuing to show reluctance, helped him to rise, while the executioners fastened one arm of the cross on his shoulders, and he walked behind our Lord, thus relieving him in a great measure from its weight, and when all was arranged, the procession moved forward. Simon was a stout-looking man, apparently about forty years of age. His children were dressed in tunics, made of a variegated material. The two eldest, named Rufus and Alexander, afterwards joined the disciples. The third was much younger, but a few years later went to live with St. Stephen. Simon had not carried the cross after Jesus any length of time before he felt his heart deeply touched by grace. Chapter 34 The Veil of Veronica While the procession was passing through a long street, an incident took place which made a strong impression upon Simon. Numbers of respectable persons were hurrying towards the temple, of whom many got out of the way when they saw Jesus, from a pharisaical fear of defilement, while others, on the contrary, stopped and expressed pity for his sufferings. But when the procession had advanced about two hundred steps from the spot where Simon began to assist our Lord in carrying his cross, the door of a beautiful house on the left opened, and a woman of majestic appearance, holding a young girl by the hand, came out and walked up to the very head of the procession. Seraphia was the name of the brave woman who thus dared to confront the enraged multitude. She was the wife of Sirach, one of the counselors belonging to the temple, and was afterwards known by the name of Veronica, which name was given from the words Vera Icon, or True Portrait, to commemorate her brave conduct on this day. Seraphia had prepared some excellent aromatic wine, which she piously intended to present to our Lord, to refresh him on his dolorous way to Calvary. She had been standing in the street for some time, and at last went back into the house to wait. She was, when I first saw her, enveloped in a long veil, and holding a little girl of nine years of age, whom she had adopted by the hand. A large veil was likewise hanging on her arm, and the little girl endeavored to hide the jar of wine when the procession approached. Those who were marching at the head of the procession tried to push her back, but she made her way through the mob, the soldiers and the archers, reached Jesus, fell on her knees before him, and presented the veil, saying at the same time, Permit me to wipe the face of my Lord. Jesus took the veil in his left hand, wiped his bleeding face, and returned it with thanks. Seraphia kissed it and put it under her cloak. The girl then timidly offered the wine, but the brutal soldiers would not allow Jesus to drink it. The suddenness of this courageous act of Seraphia had surprised the guards and caused a momentary, although unintentional, halt, of which she had taken advantage to present the veil to her divine master. Both the Pharisees and the guards were greatly exasperated, not only by the sudden halt, but much more by the public testimony of veneration, which was thus paid to Jesus, and they revenged themselves by striking and abusing him, while Seraphia returned in haste to her house. No sooner did she reach her room than she placed the woolen veil on a table and fell almost senseless on her knees. A friend who entered the room a short time after found her thus kneeling, 
with the child weeping by her side, and saw, to his astonishment, the bloody countenance of our Lord, imprinted upon the veil, a perfect likeness, although heart-rending and painful to look at. He roused Seraphia and pointed to the veil. She again knelt down before it and exclaimed through her tears, Now I shall indeed leave all with a happy heart, for my Lord has given me a remembrance of himself. The texture of this veil was a species of very fine wool. It was three times the length of its width and was generally worn on the shoulders. It was customary to present these veils to persons who were in affliction or over fatigued or ill, that they might wipe their faces with them, and it was done in order to express sympathy or compassion. Veronica kept this veil until her death and hung it at the head of her bed. It was then given to the Blessed Virgin, who left it to the apostles, and they afterwards passed it on to the church. Seraphia and John the Baptist were cousins, her father and Zacharias being brothers. When Joachim and Anna brought the Blessed Virgin, who was then only four years old, up to Jerusalem to place her among the virgins in the temple, they lodged in the house of Zacharias, which was situated near the fish market. Seraphia was at least five years older than the Blessed Virgin, was present at her marriage with St. Joseph, and was likewise related to the aged Simeon, who prophesied when the child Jesus was put into his arms. She was brought up with his sons, both of whom, as well as Seraphia, he imbued with his ardent desire of seeing our Lord. When Jesus was twelve years old and remained teaching in the temple, Seraphia, who was not then married, sent food for him every day to a little inn, a quarter of a mile from Jerusalem, where he dwelt when he was not in the temple. Mary went there for two days, when on her way from Bethlehem to Jerusalem, to offer her child in the temple. The two old men who kept this inn were Essenians, and were well acquainted with the Holy Family. It contained a kind of foundation for the poor, and Jesus and his disciples often went there for a night's lodging. Seraphia married rather late in her life. Her husband, Sirach, was descended from the chaste Susanna and was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was at first greatly opposed to our Lord, and his wife suffered much on account of her attachment to Jesus and to the holy women. But Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus brought him to a better state of feeling, and he allowed Seraphia to follow our Lord. When Jesus was unjustly accused in the court of Caiaphas, the husband of Seraphia joined with Joseph and Nicodemus in attempts to obtain the liberation of our Lord, and all three resigned their seats in the council. Seraphia was about fifty at the time of the triumphant procession of our Lord when he entered into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, and I then saw her take off her veil and spread it on the ground for him to walk upon. It was this same veil which she presented to Jesus at this, his second procession, a procession which outwardly appeared to be far less glorious, but in fact was much more so. This veil obtained for her the name of Veronica, and it is still shown for the veneration of the faithful. Chapter 35 The Fourth and Fifth Fall of Jesus, the Daughters of Jerusalem The procession was still at some distance from the southwest gate, which was large and attached to the fortifications, and the street was rough and steep. It had first to pass under a vaulted arch, then over a bridge, and finally under a second arch. The wall on the left side of the gate runs first in a southerly direction, then deviates a little to the west, and finally runs to the south behind Mount Sion. When the procession was near this gate, the brutal archers shoved Jesus into a stagnant pool, which was close to it. Simon of Cyrene, in his endeavors to avoid the pool, gave the cross a twist, which caused Jesus to fall down for the fourth time in the midst of the dirty mud, 
and Simon had the greatest difficulty in lifting up the cross again. Jesus then exclaimed in a tone which, although clear, was moving and sad, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered together thy children, as the hen doth gather her chickens under her wings, and thou wouldest not? When the Pharisees heard these words, they became still more angry, and recommencing their insults and blows, endeavored to force him to get up out of the mud. Their cruelty to Jesus so exasperated Simon of Cyrene that he at last exclaimed, If you continue this brutal conduct, I will throw down the cross and carry it no farther. I will do so if you kill me for it. A narrow and stony path was visible as soon as the gate was passed, and this path ran in a northerly direction and led to Calvary. The high road from which it deviates divided shortly after into three branches, one to the southwest, which led to Bethlehem, through the Vale of Gihon, a second to the south towards Emmaus and Joppa, a third likewise to the southwest, wound round Calvary and terminated at the gate which led to Bethsur. A person standing at the gate through which Jesus was led might easily see the gate of Bethlehem. The officers had fastened an inscription upon a post, which stood at the commencement of the road to Calvary, to inform those who passed by that Jesus and the two thieves were condemned to death. A group of women had gathered together near the spot, and were weeping and lamenting. Many carried young children in their arms. The greatest part were young maidens and women from Jerusalem, who had preceded the procession, but a few came from Bethlehem, from Hebron, and from other neighboring places in order to celebrate the Pasch. Jesus was on the point of falling again, but Simon, who was behind, perceiving that he could not stand, hastened to support him. He leant upon Simon and was thus saved from falling to the ground. When the women and children of whom we have spoken above, saw the deplorable condition to which our Lord was reduced. They uttered loud cries, wept, and according to the Jewish custom, presented him cloths to wipe his face. Jesus turned towards them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not over me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the day shall come wherein they will say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that have not borne, and the paps that have not given suck. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall upon us, and to the hills, cover us. For if in the green wood they do these things, what shall be done in the dry? He then addressed a few words of consolation to them, which I do not exactly remember. The procession made a momentary halt, the executioners, who set off first, had reached Calvary with the instruments for the execution, and were followed by a hundred of the Roman soldiers, who had started with Pilate. He only accompanied the procession as far as the gateway, and returned to town. Chapter 36 Jesus on Mount Golgotha Sixth and Seventh Falls of Jesus The procession had again moved on, the road was very steep and rough between the walls of the city and Calvary, and Jesus had the greatest difficulty in walking with his heavy burden on his shoulders, but his cruel enemies, far from feeling the slightest compassion or giving the least assistance, continued to urge him on by the infliction of hard blows and the utterance of dreadful curses. At last, they reached a spot where the pathway turned suddenly to the south, here he stumbled and fell for the sixth time. The fall was a dreadful one, but the guards only struck him the harder to force him to get up, and no sooner did he reach Calvary than he sank down again for the seventh time. Simon of Cyrene was filled with indignation and pity. Notwithstanding his fatigue, he wished to remain that he might assist Jesus, but the archers first reviled, and then drove him away, and he soon after joined the body of disciples. 
The executioners then ordered the workmen and the boys who had carried the instruments for the execution to depart, and the Pharisees soon arrived, for they were on horseback, and had taken the smooth and easy road which ran to the east of Calvary. There was a fine view of the whole town of Jerusalem from the top of Calvary. This top was circular and about the size of an ordinary riding school, surrounded by a low wall and with five separate entrances. This appeared to be the usual number in those parts, for there were five roads at the baths, at the place where they baptized, at the pool of Bethsaida, and there were likewise many towns with five gates. In this, as in many other peculiarities of the Holy Land, there was a deep, prophetic signification. That number five, which so often occurred, was a type of those five sacred wounds of our blessed Lord, which were to open to us the gates of heaven. The horsemen stopped on the west side of the mount, where the declivity was not so steep, for the side up which the criminals were brought was both rough and steep. About a hundred soldiers were stationed on different parts of the mountain, and as space was required, the thieves were not brought to the top, but ordered to halt before they reached it, and to lie down on the ground with their arms fastened to their crosses. Soldiers stood around and guarded them, while crowds of persons who did not fear defiling themselves stood near the platform or on the neighboring heights. These were mostly of the lower classes, strangers, slaves, and pagans, and a number of them were women. It wanted about a quarter to twelve when Jesus, loaded with his cross, sank down at the precise spot where he was to be crucified. The barbarous executioners dragged him up, by the cords which they had fastened round his waist and then untied the arms of the cross and threw them on the ground. The sight of our blessed Lord at this moment was indeed calculated to move the hardest heart to compassion. He stood or rather bent over the cross, being scarcely able to support himself. His heavenly countenance was pale and wan as that of a person on the verge of death although wounds and blood disfigured it to a frightful degree. But the hearts of these cruel men were, alas, harder than iron itself, and far from showing the slightest commiseration, they threw him brutally down, exclaiming in a jeering tone, Most powerful king, we are about to prepare thy throne. Jesus immediately placed himself upon the cross, and they measured him and marked the places for his feet and hands, whilst the Pharisees continued to insult their unresisting victim. When the measurement was finished, they led him to a cave cut in the rock, which had been used formerly as a cellar, opened the door, and pushed him in so roughly that had it not been for the support of angels, his legs must have been broken by so hard a fall on the rough stone floor. I most distinctly heard his groans of pain, but they closed the door quickly and placed guards before it, and the archers continued their preparations for the crucifixion. The center of the platform mentioned above was the most elevated part of Calvary. It was a round eminence, about two feet high, and persons were obliged to ascend two or three steps to reach its top. The executioners dug the holes for the three crosses at the top of this eminence and placed those intended for the thieves, one on the right and the other on the left of our lords. Both were lower and more roughly made than his. They then carried the cross of our Savior to the spot where they intended to crucify him and placed it in such a position that it would easily fall into the hole prepared for it. They fastened the two arms strongly onto the body of the cross, nailed the board at the bottom which was to support the feet, bored the holes for the nails, and cut different hollows in the wood for the parts which would receive the head and back of our Lord in order that his body might rest against the cross instead of being suspended from it. Their aim in this was the prolongation of his tortures, for if the whole weight of his body was allowed to fall upon the hands, 
the holes might be quite torn open, and death ensue more speedily than they desired. The executioners then drove into the ground the pieces of wood which were intended to keep the cross upright, and made a few other similar preparations. Chapter 37 The Departure of Mary and the Holy Women for Calvary Although the Blessed Virgin was carried away fainting after the sad meeting with her son, loaded with his cross, yet she soon recovered consciousness for love and the ardent desire of seeing him once more, imparted to her a supernatural feeling of strength. Accompanied by her companions, she went to the house of Lazarus, which was at the bottom of the town, and where Martha, Magdalene, and many holy women were already assembled. All were sad and depressed, but Magdalene could not restrain her tears and lamentations. They started from this house, about seventeen in number, to make the way of the cross, that is to say, to follow every step Jesus had taken in this most painful journey. Mary counted each footstep, and being interiorly enlightened, pointed out to her companions those places which had been consecrated by peculiar sufferings. Then did the sharp sword, predicted by aged Simeon, impress for the first time in the heart of Mary, that touching devotion which has since been so constantly practiced in the church. Mary imparted it to her companions, and they in turn left it to future generations, a most precious gift indeed, bestowed by our Lord on his blessed mother, and which passed from her heart to the hearts of her children through the revered voice of tradition. When these holy women reached the house of Veronica, they entered it, because Pilate and his officers were at that moment passing through the street on their way home. They burst forth into unrestrained tears when they beheld the countenance of Jesus imprinted on the veil, and they returned thanks to God for the favor he had bestowed on his faithful servant. They took the jar of aromatic wine, which the Jews had prevented Jesus from drinking, and set off together towards Golgotha. Their number was considerably increased, for many pious men and women, whom the sufferings of our Lord had filled with pity, had joined them. And they ascended the west side of Calvary, as the declivity there was not so great. The mother of Jesus, accompanied by her niece, Mary, the daughter of Cleophas, John and Salome, went quite up to the round platform. But Martha, Mary of Heli, Veronica, Joanna, Chusa, Susanna, and Mary, the mother of Mark, remained below with Magdalene, who could hardly support herself. Lower down on the mountain, there was a third group of holy women, and there were a few scattered individuals between the three groups, who carried messages from one to the other. The Pharisees on horseback rode to and fro among the people, and the five entrances were guarded by Roman soldiers. Mary kept her eyes fixed on the fatal spot, and stood as if entranced. It was indeed a sight calculated to appall and rend the heart of a mother. There lay the terrible cross, the hammers, the ropes, the nails, and alongside of these frightful instruments of torture stood the brutal executioners, half drunk, and almost without clothing, swearing and blaspheming whilst making their preparations. The sufferings of the Blessed Virgin were greatly increased by her not being able to see her son. She knew that he was still alive, and she felt the most ardent desire once more to behold him, and the thought of the torments he still had to endure made her heart ready to burst with grief. A little hail had been falling at times during the morning, but the sun came out again after ten o'clock, and a thick red fog began to obscure it towards twelve. Chapter 38 The Nailing of Jesus to the Cross The preparations for the crucifixion being finished, four archers went to the cave where they had confined our Lord, and dragged him out with their usual brutality, while the mob looked on and made use of insulting language, and the Roman soldiers regarded all with indifference 
and thought of nothing but maintaining order. When Jesus was again brought forth, the holy women gave a man some money and begged him to pay the archers anything they might demand if they would allow Jesus to drink the wine which Veronica had prepared. But the cruel executioners, instead of giving it to Jesus, drank it themselves. They had brought two vases with them, one of which contained vinegar and gall, and the other a mixture which looked like wine mixed with myrrh and absinthe. They offered a glass of the latter to our Lord, which he tasted but would not drink. There were eighteen archers on the platform, the six who had scourged Jesus, the four who had conducted him to Calvary, the two who held the ropes that supported the cross, and six others who came for the purpose of crucifying him. They were strangers in the pay of either the Jews or the Romans, and were short, thick-set men, with most ferocious countenances, rather resembling wild beasts than human beings, and employing themselves alternately in drinking and in making preparations for the crucifixion. This scene was rendered the more frightful to me by the sight of demons who were invisible to others, and I saw large bodies of evil spirits under the forms of toads, serpents, sharp-clawed dragons, and venomous insects, urging these wicked men to still greater cruelty and perfectly darkening the air. They crept into the mouths and into the hearts of the assistants, sat upon their shoulders, filled their minds with wicked images, and incited them to revile and insult our Lord with still greater brutality. Weeping angels, however, stood round Jesus, and the sight of their tears consoled me not a little, and they were accompanied by little angels of glory, whose heads alone I saw. There were likewise angels of pity and angels of consolation among them. The latter frequently approached the Blessed Virgin and the rest of the pious persons who were assembled there, and whispered words of comfort which enabled them to bear up with firmness. The executioners soon pulled off our Lord's cloak, the belt to which the ropes were fastened, and his own belt, when they found it was impossible to drag the woolen garment which his mother had woven for him over his head, on account of the crown of thorns. They tore off this most painful crown, thus reopening every wound, and seizing the garment, tore it mercilessly over his bleeding and wounded head. Our dear Lord and Savior then stood before his cruel enemies, stripped of all save the short scapular which was on his shoulders and the linen which girded his loins his scapular was of wool the wool had stuck to the wounds and indescribable was the agony of pain he suffered when they pulled it roughly off he shook like the aspen as he stood before them for he was so weakened from sufferings and loss of blood that he could not support himself for more than a few moments he was covered with open wounds, and his shoulders and back were torn to the bone by the dreadful scourging he had endured. He was about to fall when the executioners, fearing that he might die, and thus deprive them of the barbarous pleasure of crucifying him, led him to a large stone and pushed him roughly down upon it. But no sooner was he seated than they aggravated his sufferings, by putting the crown of thorns again upon his head. They then offered him some vinegar and gall, from which, however, he turned away in silence. The executioners did not allow him to rest long, but bid him rise and place himself on the cross, that they might nail him to it. Then seizing his right arm, they dragged it to the hole prepared for the nail, and having tied it tightly down with a cord, one of them knelt upon his sacred chest, a second held his hand flat, and a third, taking a long thick nail, pressed it on the open palm of that adorable hand, which had ever been open to bestow blessings and favors on the ungrateful Jews, and with a great iron hammer, drove it through the flesh and far into the wood of the cross. Our Lord uttered one deep but suppressed groan, and his blood gushed forth, and sprinkled the arms of the archers. 
I counted the blows of the hammer, but my extreme grief made me forget their number. The nails were very large, the heads about the size of a crown piece, and the thickness that of a man's thumb, while the points came through at the back of the cross. The Blessed Virgin stood motionless. From time to time you might distinguish her plaintive moans. She appeared as if almost fainting from grief, and Magdalene was quite beside herself. When the executioners had nailed the right hand of our Lord, they perceived that his left hand did not reach the hole they had bored to receive the nail. Therefore they tied ropes to his left arm, and having steadied their feet against the cross, pulled the left hand violently until it reached the place prepared for it. This dreadful process caused our Lord indescribable agony. His breast heaved, and his legs were quite contracted. They again knelt upon him, tied down his arms, and drove the second nail into his left hand. His blood flowed afresh, and his feeble groans were once more heard between the blows of the hammer, but nothing could move the hard-hearted executioners to the slightest pity. The arms of Jesus, thus unnaturally stretched out, no longer covered the arms of the cross, which were sloped. There was a wide space between them and his armpits. Each additional torture and insult inflicted on our Lord caused a fresh pang in the heart of his blessed mother. She became white as a corpse, but as the Pharisees endeavored to increase her pain by insulting words and gestures, the disciples led her to a group of pious women who were standing a little farther off. The executioners had fastened a piece of wood at the lower part of the cross, under where the feet of Jesus would be nailed, that thus the weight of his body might not rest upon the wounds of his hands, as also to prevent the bones of his feet from being broken when nailed to the cross. A hole had been pierced in this wood to receive the nail when driven through his feet, and there was likewise a little hollow place for his heels. These precautions were taken lest his wounds should be torn open by the weight of his body, and death ensue before he had suffered all the tortures which they hoped to see him endure. The whole body of our Lord had been dragged upward and contracted by the violent manner with which the executioners had stretched out his arms, and his knees were bent up. They therefore flattened and tied them down tightly with cords, but soon perceiving that his feet did not reach the bit of wood which was placed for them to rest upon, they became infuriated. Some of their number proposed making fresh holes for the nails which pierced his hands, as there would be considerable difficulty in removing the bit of wood, but the others would do nothing of the sort and continue to vociferate. He will not stretch himself out, but we will help him. They accompanied these words with the most fearful oaths and imprecations, and having fastened a rope to his right leg, dragged it violently until it reached the wood, then tied it down as tightly as possible. The agony which Jesus suffered from this violent tension was indescribable. The words, My God, my God, escaped his lips and the executioners increased his pain by tying his chest and arms to the cross, lest the hands should be torn from the nails. They then fastened his left foot to his right foot, having first bored a hole through them with a species of piercer, because they could not be placed in such a position as to be nailed together at once. Next they took a very long nail and drove it completely through both feet into the cross below, which operation was more than usually painful, on account of his body being so unnaturally stretched out. I counted at least six and thirty blows of the hammer. During the whole time of the crucifixion, our Lord never ceased praying and repeating those passages in the Psalms, which he was then accomplishing, although from time to time a feeble moan caused by excess of suffering might be heard. In this manner he had prayed when carrying his cross, and thus he continued to pray until his death. 
I heard him repeat all the prophecies. I repeated them after him, and I have often since noted the different passages when reading the Psalms, but I now feel so exhausted with grief that I cannot at all connect them. When the crucifixion of Jesus was finished, the commander of the Roman soldiers ordered Pilate's inscription to be nailed on the top of the cross. The Pharisees were much incensed at this, and their anger was increased by the jeers of the Roman soldiers, who pointed at their crucified king. They therefore hastened back to Jerusalem, determined to use their best endeavors to persuade the governor to allow them to substitute another inscription. It was about a quarter past twelve when Jesus was crucified, and at the moment the cross was lifted up, the temple resounded with the blast of trumpets, which were always blown to announce the sacrifice of the Paschal Lamb. Chapter 39 Exaltation of the Cross When the executioners had finished the crucifixion of our Lord, they tied ropes to the trunk of the cross, and fastened the ends of these ropes round a long beam, which was fixed firmly in the ground at a little distance, and by means of these ropes they raised the cross. Some of their number supported it, while others shoved its foot towards the hole prepared for its reception. The heavy cross fell into this hole with a frightful shock. Jesus uttered a faint cry, and his wounds were torn open in the most fearful manner. His blood again burst forth, and his half-dislocated bones knocked one against the other. The archers pushed the cross to get it thoroughly into the hole, and caused it to vibrate still more by planting five stakes around to support it. A terrible, but at the same time, a touching sight it was, to behold the cross raised up in the midst of the vast concourse of persons who were assembled all around, not only insulting soldiers, proud Pharisees, and the brutal Jewish mob were there, but likewise strangers from all parts. The air resounded with acclamations and derisive cries when they beheld it towering on high, and after vibrating for a moment in the air, fall with a heavy crash into the hole cut for it in the rock. But words of love and compassion resounded through the air at the same moment, and need we say that these words, these sounds were emitted by the most saintly of human beings, Mary, John, the holy women, and all who were pure of heart. They bowed down and adored the word made flesh, nailed to the cross. They stretched forth their hands as if desirous of giving assistance to the holy of holies, whom they beheld nailed to a cross and in the power of his furious enemies. But when the solemn sound of the fall of the cross into the hole prepared for it in the rock was heard, a dead silence ensued. Every heart was filled with an undefinable feeling of awe, a feeling never before experienced, and for which no one could account, even to himself. All the inmates of hell shook with terror and vented their rage by endeavoring to stimulate the enemies of Jesus to still greater fury and brutality. The souls in limbo were filled with joy and hope, for the sound was to them a harbinger of happiness, the prelude to the appearance of their deliverer. Thus was the blessed cross of our Lord planted for the first time on the earth, and well might it be compared to the tree of life in paradise, for the wounds of Jesus were as sacred fountains, from which flowed four rivers destined to purify the world from the curse of sin, and to give it fertility, so as to produce fruit unto salvation. The eminence on which the cross was planted was about two feet higher than the surrounding parts. The feet of Jesus were sufficiently near the ground for his friends to be able to reach to kiss them, and his face was turned to the northwest. Chapter 40 Crucifixion of the Thieves During the time of the crucifixion of Jesus, the two thieves were left lying on the ground at some distance off. Their arms were fastened to the crosses on which they were to be executed, and a few soldiers stood near on guard. 
The accusation which had been proved against them was that of having assassinated a Jewish woman who, with her children, was traveling from Jerusalem to Joppa. They were arrested under the disguise of rich merchants at a castle in which Pilate resided occasionally when employed in exercising his troops, and they had been imprisoned for a long time before being brought to trial. The thief placed on the left side was much older than the other, a regular miscreant who had corrupted the younger. They were commonly called Dismas and Gesmus, and as I forget their real names, I shall distinguish them by these terms, calling the good one Dismas and the wicked one Gesmus. Both the one and the other belonged to a band of robbers who infested the frontiers of Egypt, and it was in a cave inhabited by these robbers that the Holy Family took refuge when flying into Egypt at the time of the massacre of the innocents. The poor leprous child, who was instantly cleansed by being dipped in the water which had been used for washing the infant Jesus, was no other than this dismiss, and the charity of his mother in receiving and granting hospitality to the Holy Family had been rewarded by the cure of her child, while this outward purification was an emblem of the inward purification which was afterwards accomplished in the soul of Dismas on Mount Calvary, through that sacred blood which was then shed on the cross for our redemption. Dismas knew nothing at all about Jesus, but as his heart was not hardened, the sight of the extreme patience of our Lord moved him much. When the executioners had finished putting up the cross of Jesus, they ordered the thieves to rise without delay, and they loosened their fetters in order to crucify them at once, as the sky was becoming very cloudy and bore every appearance of an approaching storm. After giving them some myrrh and vinegar, they stripped off their ragged clothing, tied ropes around their arms, and by the help of small ladders, drag them up to their places on the cross. The executioners then bound the arms of the thieves to the cross with cords made of the bark of trees and fastened their wrists, elbows, knees, and feet in like manner, drawing the cords so tight that their joints cracked and the blood burst out. They uttered piercing cries, and the good thief exclaimed as they were drawing him up, this torture is dreadful, but if they had treated us as they treated the poor Galilean, we should have been dead long ago. The executioners had divided the garments of Jesus in order to draw lots for them. His mantle, which was narrow at the top, was very wide at the bottom and lined over the chest, thus forming a pocket between the lining and the material itself. The lining they pulled out tore into bands and divided. They did the same with his long white robe, belt, scapular, and undergarment, which was completely saturated with his sacred blood. Not being able to agree as to who was to be the possessor of the seamless robe woven by his mother, which could not be cut up and divided, they brought out a species of chessboard marked with figures and were about to decide the point by lots when a messenger sent by Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea informed them that there were persons ready to purchase all the clothes of Jesus, they therefore gathered them together and sold them in a bundle. Thus did the Christians get possession of those precious relics. Chapter 41 Jesus Hanging on the Cross Between the Two Thieves the tremendous concussion caused by the fall of the cross into the hole prepared for it drove the sharp points of the crown of thorns, which was still upon the head of our dear Savior, still deeper into his sacred flesh, and blood ran down again in streams, both from it and from his hands and feet. The archers then placed ladders against the sides of the cross, mounted them, and unfastened the ropes with which they had bound our Lord to the cross, previous to lifting it up, fearing that the shock might tear open the wounds in his hands and feet, and that then the nails would no longer support his body. 
his blood had become, in a certain degree, stagnated by his horizontal position and the pressure of the cords, but when these were withdrawn, it resumed its usual course and caused such agonizing sensations throughout his countless wounds that he bowed his head and remained as if dead for more than seven minutes. A pause ensued. The executioners were occupied with the division of his garments. The trumpets in the temple no longer resounded, and all the actors in this fearful tragedy appeared to be exhausted, some by grief and others by the efforts they had made to compass their wicked ends, and by the joy which they felt now at having at last succeeded in bringing about the death of him whom they had so long envied. With mixed feelings of fear and compassion, I cast my eyes upon Jesus, Jesus my Redeemer, the Redeemer of the world. I beheld him motionless and almost lifeless. I felt as if I myself must expire. My heart was overwhelmed between grief, love, and horror. My mind was half wandering, my hands and feet burning with a feverish heat. Each vein, nerve, and limb was racked with an inexpressible pain. I saw nothing distinctly, excepting my beloved spouse hanging on the cross. I contemplated his disfigured countenance, his head encircled with that terrible crown of thorns, which prevented his raising it even for a moment without the most intense suffering, his mouth parched and half open from exhaustion, and his hair and beard clotted with blood. His chest was torn with stripes and wounds, and his elbows, wrists, and shoulders so violently distended as to be almost dislocated. Blood constantly trickled down from the gaping wounds in his hands, and the flesh was so torn from his ribs that you might almost count them. His legs and thighs, as also his arms, were stretched out almost to dislocation, the flesh and muscles so completely laid bare that every bone was visible, and his whole body covered with black, green, and reeking wounds. The blood which flowed from his wounds was at first red, but it became by degrees light and watery, and the whole appearance of his body was that of a corpse ready for interment. And yet, notwithstanding the horrible wounds with which he was covered, notwithstanding the state of ignominy to which he was reduced, there still remained that inexpressible look of dignity and goodness which had ever filled all beholders with awe. The complexion of our Lord was fair like that of Mary and slightly tinted with red, but his exposure to the weather during the last three years had tanned him considerably. His chest was wide, but not hairy like that of St. John the Baptist, his shoulders broad, and his arms and thighs sinewy. His knees were strong and hardened, as is usually the case with those who have either walked or knelt much and his legs long, with very strong muscles. His feet were well formed, and his hands beautiful, the fingers being long and tapering, and although not delicate, like those of a woman, still not resembling those of a man who had labored hard. His neck was rather long, with a well-set and finely proportioned head, his forehead large and high, his face oval, his hair, which was far from thick, was of a golden-brown color, parted in the middle and falling over his shoulders. His beard was not any great length, but pointed and divided under the chin. When I contemplated him on the cross, his hair was almost all torn off, and what remained was matted and clotted with blood. His body was one wound, and every limb seemed as if dislocated. The crosses of the two thieves were placed, the one to the right and the other to the left of Jesus. There was sufficient space left for a horseman to ride between them. Nothing can be imagined more distressing than the appearance of the thieves on their crosses. They suffer terribly, and the one on the left-hand side never ceased cursing and swearing. 
The cords with which they were tied were very tight and caused great pain. Their countenances were livid and their eyes inflamed and ready to start from the sockets. The height of the crosses of the two thieves was much less than that of our Lord. Chapter 42 First Word of Jesus on the Cross as soon as the executioners had crucified the two thieves and divided the garments of Jesus between them, they gathered up their tools, addressed a few more insulting words to our Lord, and went away. The Pharisees, likewise, rode up to Jesus, looked at him scornfully, made use of some opprobrious expressions, and then left the place. The Roman soldiers, of whom a hundred had been posted round Calvary, were marched away, and their places filled by fifty others, the command of whom was given to Abinadar, an Arab by birth, who afterwards took the name of Cestaphon in baptism. And the second in command was Cassius, who, when he became a Christian, was known by the name of Longinus. Pilate frequently made use of him as a messenger. Twelve Pharisees, twelve Sadducees, as many scribes and a few ancients, accompanied by those Jews who had been endeavoring to persuade Pilate to change the inscription on the cross of Jesus, then came up. They were furious as the Roman governor had given them a direct refusal. They rode round the platform and drove away the Blessed Virgin, whom St. John led to the holy women. When they passed the cross of Jesus, they shook their heads disdainfully at him, exclaiming at the same time, Bah! Thou that destroyest the temple of God, and in three days buildest it up again, save thyself, coming down from the cross. Let Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross, that we may see and believe. The soldiers, likewise, made use of deriding language. The countenance and whole body of Jesus became even more colorless. He appeared to be on the point of fainting, and Gesmus, the wicked thief, exclaimed, The demon by whom he is possessed is about to leave him. A soldier then took a sponge, filled it with vinegar, put it on a reed, and presented it to Jesus, who appeared to drink. If thou art the king of the Jews, said the soldier, save thyself, coming down from the cross. These things took place during the time that the first band of soldiers was being relieved by that of Abinadar. Jesus raised his head a little and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And Gesmus cried out, if thou art the Christ, save thyself and us. Dismas, the good thief, was silent, but he was deeply moved at the prayer of Jesus for his enemies. When Mary heard the voice of her son, unable to restrain herself, she rushed forward, followed by John, Salome, and Mary of Cleophas, and approached the cross, which the kind-hearted centurion did not prevent. The prayers of Jesus obtained for the good thief a most powerful grace. He suddenly remembered that it was Jesus and Mary who had cured him of leprosy in his childhood, and he exclaimed in a loud and clear voice, How can you insult him when he prays for you? He has been silent and suffered all your outrages with patience. He is truly a prophet. He is our king. He is the Son of God. This unexpected reproof from the lips of a miserable malefactor who was dying on a cross caused a tremendous commotion among the spectators. They gathered up stones and wished to throw them at him, but the centurion Abinadar would not allow it. The Blessed Virgin was much comforted and strengthened by the prayer of Jesus, and Dismas said to Gesmus, who was still blaspheming Jesus. Neither dost thou fear God, seeing thou art under the same condemnation, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done no evil. 
Remember, thou art now at the point of death, and repent. He was enlightened and touched. He confessed his sins to Jesus and said, Lord, if thou condemnest me, it will be with justice. And Jesus replied, Thou shalt experience my mercy. Dismas, filled with the most perfect contrition, began instantly to thank God for the great graces he had received, and to reflect upon the manifold sins of his past life. All these events took place between twelve and the half hour, shortly after the crucifixion. But such a surprising change had taken place in the appearance of nature during that time, as to astonish the beholders and fill their minds with awe and terror. Chapter 43 Eclipse of the Sun Second and Third Word of Jesus on the Cross A little hail had fallen at about ten o'clock, when Pilate was passing sentence, and after that the weather cleared up, until towards twelve, when a thick, red-looking fog began to obscure the sun. Towards the sixth hour, according to the manner of counting of the Jews, the sun was suddenly darkened. I was shown the exact cause of this wonderful phenomenon, but I have unfortunately partly forgotten it, and what I have not forgotten I cannot find words to express. But I was lifted up from the earth, and beheld the stars and the planets moving about out of their proper spheres. I saw the moon like an immense ball of fire, rolling along as if flying from the earth. I was then suddenly taken back to Jerusalem, and I beheld the moon reappear behind the mountain of olives, looking pale and full, and advancing rapidly towards the sun, which was dim and overshrouded by a fog. I saw to the east of the sun a large dark body which had the appearance of a mountain, and which soon entirely hid the sun. The center of this body was dark yellow, and a red circle with a ring of fire was around it. The sky grew darker, and the stars appeared to cast a red and lurid light. Both men and beasts were struck with terror. The enemies of Jesus ceased reviling him, while the Pharisees endeavored to give philosophical reasons for what was taking place, but they failed in their attempt and were reduced to silence. Many were seized with remorse, struck their breasts, and cried out, May his blood fall upon his murderers! Numbers of others, whether near the cross or at a distance, fell on their knees and entreated forgiveness of Jesus, who turned his eyes compassionately upon them in the midst of his sufferings. However, the darkness continued to increase, and everyone, excepting Mary and the most faithful among the friends of Jesus, left the cross. Dismas then raised his head, and in a tone of humility and hope, said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou shalt come into thy kingdom. And Jesus made answer, Amen, I say to thee, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. Magdalene, Mary of Cleophas, and John stood near the cross of our Lord and looked at him, while the Blessed Virgin, filled with intense feelings of motherly love, entreated her son to permit her to die with him. But he, casting a look of ineffable tenderness upon her, turned to John and said, Woman, behold thy son. Then he said to John, Behold thy mother. John looked at his dying Redeemer and saluted his beloved mother, whom he henceforth considered as his own, in the most respectful manner. The Blessed Virgin was so overcome by grief at these words of Jesus that she almost fainted and was carried to a short distance from the cross by the holy women. I do not know whether Jesus really pronounced these words, but I felt interiorly that he gave Mary to John as a mother and John to Mary as a son. In similar visions, a person is often conscious of things which are not written, and words can only express a portion of them. Although to the individual to whom they are shown, they are so clear as not to require 
explanation. For this reason, it did not appear to me in the least surprising that Jesus should call the Blessed Virgin woman instead of mother. I felt that he intended to demonstrate that she was that woman spoken of in scripture who was to crush the head of the serpent and that then was the moment in which that promise was accomplished by the death of her son. I knew that Jesus, by giving her as a mother to John, gave her also as a mother to all who believe in him, who become children of God, and are not born of flesh and blood, or of the will of man, but of God. Neither did it appear to me surprising that the most pure, the most humble, and the most obedient among women, who, when saluted by the angel as full of grace, immediately replied, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it done to me according to thy word. And in whose sacred womb the word was instantly made flesh, that she, when informed by her dying son, that she was to become the spiritual mother of another son, should repeat the same words with humble obedience, and immediately adopt as her children all the children of God, the brothers of Jesus Christ. These things are much easier to feel by the grace of God than to be expressed in words. I remember my celestial spouse once saying to me, Everything is imprinted in the hearts of those children of the church who believe, hope, and love. Chapter 44 The Fear Felt by the Inhabitants of Jerusalem Fourth Word of Jesus on the Cross it was about half past one o'clock when I was taken into Jerusalem to see what was going on there. The inhabitants were perfectly overcome with terror and anxiety. The streets dark and gloomy, and some persons were feeling their way about, while others, seated on the ground with their heads veiled, struck their breasts, or went up to the roofs of their houses, looked at the sky, and burst forth in bitter lamentations. Even the animals uttered mournful cries and hid themselves. The birds flew low and fell to the ground. I saw Pilate conferring with Herod on the alarming state of things. They were both extremely agitated and contemplated the appearance of the sky from that terrace upon which Herod was standing when he delivered up Jesus to be insulted by the infuriated rabble. These events are not in the common course of nature, they both exclaimed. They must be caused by the anger of the gods who are displeased at the cruelty which has been exercised towards Jesus of Nazareth. Pilate and Herod, surrounded by guards, then directed their hasty, trembling steps through the forum to Herod's palace. Pilate turned away his head when he passed Gabbatha from whence he had condemned Jesus to be crucified. The square was almost empty. A few persons might be seen re-entering their houses as quickly as possible, and a few others running about and weeping, while two or three small groups might be distinguished in the distance. Pilate sent for some of the ancients and asked them what they thought the astounding darkness could possibly portend, and said that he himself considered it a terrific proof of the anger of their God at the crucifixion of the Galilean, who was most certainly their prophet and their king. He added that he had nothing to reproach himself with on that head, for he had washed his hands of the whole affair and was therefore quite innocent. The ancients were as hardened as ever and replied in a sullen tone that there was nothing unnatural in the course of events, that they might be easily accounted for by philosophers, and that they did not repent of anything they had done. However, many persons were converted, and among others, those soldiers who fell to the ground at the words of our Lord, when they were sent to arrest him in the Garden of Olives. The rabble assembled before Pilate's house, and instead of the cry, Crucify him! Crucify him! which had resounded in the morning, 
you might have heard vociferations of, Down with the iniquitous judge! May the blood of the just man fall upon his murderers! Pilate was much alarmed. He sent for additional guards and endeavored to cast all the blame upon the Jews. He again declared that the crime was not his, that he was no subject of this Jesus, whom they had put to death unjustly, and who was their king, their prophet, their holy one, that they alone were guilty, as it must be evident to all that he condemned Jesus solely from compulsion. The temple was thronged with Jews who were intent on the immolation of the Paschal Lamb, but when the darkness increased to such a degree that it was impossible to distinguish the countenance of one from that of the other, they were seized with fear, horror, and dread, which they expressed by mournful cries and lamentations. The high priests endeavored to maintain order and quiet. All the lamps were lighted, but the confusion became greater every moment, and Annas appeared perfectly paralyzed with terror. I saw him endeavoring to hide first in one place, then in another. When I left the temple and walked through the streets, I remarked that although not a breath of wind was stirring, yet both the doors and windows of the houses were shaking as if in a storm, and the darkness was becoming every moment more dense. The consternation produced by the sudden darkness at Mount Calvary was indescribable. When it first commenced, the confusion of the noise of the hammers, the vociferations of the rabble, the cries of the two thieves on being nailed to their crosses, the insulting speeches of the Pharisees, the evolutions of the soldiers, and the drunken shouts of the executioners, had so completely engrossed the attention of every one that the change which was gradually coming over the face of nature was not remarked. But as the darkness increased, every sound ceased, each voice was hushed, and remorse and terror took possession of every heart, while the bystanders retired one by one to a distance from the cross. Then it was that Jesus gave his mother to St. John, and that she, overcome by grief, was carried away to a short distance. As the darkness continued to grow more and more dense, the silence became perfectly astounding. Everyone appeared terror-struck. Some looked at the sky, while others, filled with remorse, turned towards the cross, smote their breasts, and were converted. Although the Pharisees were in reality quite as much alarmed as other persons, yet they endeavored at first to put a bold face on the matter and declare that they could see nothing unaccountable in these events. But at last, even they lost assurance and were reduced to silence. The disk of the sun was of a dark yellow tint, rather resembling a mountain when viewed by moonlight, and it was surrounded by a bright fiery ring. The stars appeared, but the light they cast was red and lurid. The birds were so terrified as to drop to the ground. The beasts trembled and moaned. The horses and the asses of the Pharisees crept as close as possible to one another and put their heads between their legs. The thick fog penetrated everything. Stillness reigned around the cross. Jesus hung upon it alone, forsaken by all. Disciples, followers, friends, his mother even, was removed from his side. Not one person of the thousands upon whom he had lavished benefits was near to offer him the slightest alleviation in his bitter agony. His soul was overspread with an indescribable feeling of bitterness and grief. All within him was dark, gloomy, and wretched. The darkness which reigned around was but symbolical of that which overspread his interior. He turned, nevertheless, to his heavenly Father. He prayed for his enemies. He offered the chalice of his sufferings for their redemption. He continued to pray as he had done during the whole of his passion, and repeated portions of those psalms, the prophecies of which were then receiving their accomplishment in him. I saw angels standing around. Again I looked at Jesus, my beloved spouse, on his cross, 
agonizing and dying, yet still in dreary solitude. He at that moment endured anguish which no mortal pen can describe. He felt that suffering which would overwhelm a poor weak mortal if deprived at once of all consolation, both divine and human, and then compelled, without refreshment, assistance, or light, to traverse the stormy desert of tribulation, upheld by faith, hope, and charity alone. His sufferings were inexpressible, but it was by them that he merited for us the grace necessary to resist those temptations to despair which will assail us at the hour of death, that tremendous hour when we shall feel that we are about to leave all that is dear to us here below, when our minds, weakened by disease, have lost the power of reasoning, and even our hopes of mercy and forgiveness are become, as it were, enveloped in mist and uncertainty. Then it is that we must fly to Jesus, unite our feelings of desolation with that indescribable dereliction which he endured upon the cross, and be certain of obtaining a glorious victory over our infernal enemies. Jesus then offered to his eternal Father his poverty, his dereliction, his labors, and above all, the bitter sufferings which our ingratitude had caused him to endure in expiation for our sins and weaknesses. No one, therefore, who is united to Jesus in the bosom of his church must despair at the awful moment preceding his exit from this life, even if he be deprived of all sensible light and comfort, for he must then remember that the Christian is no longer obliged to enter this dark desert alone and unprotected, as Jesus has cast his own interior and exterior dereliction on the cross into this gulf of desolation. Consequently, he will not be left to cope alone with death or be suffered to leave this world in desolation of spirit, deprived of heavenly consolation. All fear of loneliness and despair in death must therefore be cast away, for Jesus, who is our true light, the way, the truth, and the life, has preceded us on that dreary road, has overspread it with blessings, and raised his cross upon it, one glance at which will calm our every fear. Jesus, then, if we may so express ourselves, made his last testament in the presence of his Father, and bequeathed the merits of his death and passion to the church and to sinners. Not one erring soul was forgotten. He thought of each and every one, praying likewise even for those heretics who have endeavored to prove that being God, he did not suffer as a man would have suffered in his place. The cry which he allowed to pass his lips in the height of his agony was intended not only to show the excess of the sufferings he was then enduring, but likewise to encourage all afflicted souls who acknowledge God as their Father, to lay their sorrows with filial confidence at his feet. It was towards three o'clock when he cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani! My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? These words of our Lord interrupted the dead silence which had continued so long. The Pharisees turned towards him, and one of them said, Behold, he calleth Elias, and another, Let us see whether Elias will come to deliver him. When Mary heard the voice of her divine son, she was unable to restrain herself any longer, but rushed forwards and returned to the foot of the cross, followed by John, Mary, the daughter of Cleophas, Mary Magdalene, and Salome. A troop of about thirty horsemen from Judea and the environs of Joppa, who were on their way to Jerusalem for the festival, passed by just at the time when all was silent round the cross, both assistants and spectators being transfixed with terror and apprehension. 
when they beheld Jesus hanging on the cross, saw the cruelty with which he had been treated, and remarked the extraordinary signs of God's wrath, which overspread the face of nature, they were filled with horror and exclaimed, If the temple of God were not in Jerusalem, the city should be burned to the ground for having taken upon itself so fearful a crime. These words from the lips of strangers, strangers too, who bore the appearance of persons of rank, made a great impression on the bystanders, and loud murmurs and exclamations of grief were heard on all sides, some individuals gathering together in groups more freely to indulge their sorrow, although a certain portion of the crowd continued to blaspheme and revile all around them. The Pharisees were compelled to assume a more humble tone, for they feared an insurrection among the people, being well aware of the great existing excitement among the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They therefore held a consultation with Abinadar, the centurion, and agreed with him that the gate of the city, which was in the vicinity, should be closed, in order to prevent farther communication, and that they should send a pilot and Herod, for five hundred men, to guard against the chance of an insurrection, the centurion in the meantime, doing all in his power to maintain order, and preventing the Pharisees from insulting Jesus, lest it should exasperate the people still more. Shortly after three o'clock, the light reappeared in a degree. The moon began to pass away from the disk of the sun, while the sun again shone forth, although its appearance was dim, being surrounded by a species of red mist. By degrees it became more bright, and the stars vanished, but the sky was still gloomy. The enemies of Jesus soon recovered their arrogant spirit when they saw the light returning, and it was then that they exclaimed, Behold, he calleth Elias! <laughs>